passage for today, continuing in Philippians, comes out of Philippians 3, verses 4 through 11. Paul says about himself, Though I myself have reason for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, speaking of playlists, uh, I was getting ready to assemble mine for uh, this trip coming up. Uh, minimum of nine and a half hours in the car, you need some good music to have. And I ran across some songs that uh, I hadn't heard in a while or hadn't listened to in a while. One of them came from a group called the Supertones that uh, Rach and I were really, really into when we would uh, when we were going out. Now their concerts are a bit loud, so I would uh, probably recommend listening to them from the back row. Um, but they have one song that's, uh, their lyrics kind of go like this. They say, he who dies, excuse me, he who gets the most toys and dies is the winner. I'm living the high life with lobster tail dinners. My Lexus, my yacht, my gold chains and rings. These are a few of my favorite things. Can you not hear me, Dave? Any better there? Okay. But most of all, I keep my billfold closest to my heart. House decorated with million dollar works of art. Roll with the bigwigs. They think I'm the man. Now that sounds like the life. Not that I know anything about having you know, my apartment filled with million dollar works of art or driving a Lexus or uh, having gold chains and rings and all that kind of stuff. That's um, certainly not been my life experience, but it reminds me of those commercials they'd have uh, where people would call in and, and ask if they're, ask these beer guys if they're living the high life. And they'd say, you know, yeah, I got my, I'm on my yacht and I got uh, uh, having lobster with uh, Dom Perignon or whatever, and you know, is this the high life? And uh, the guys would be like, yeah, that's, you know, that's the high life for you. Um, it sounds like a life of good times and happiness and, and joy, at least as far as the world would tell us. That's kind of the, the theme that Paul writes about in this letter, as I've said a couple times, uh, you know, constantly saying about rejoice and joy and be joyful. It's unlike some of his other letters, and he's not trying to answer some specific doctrinal issue or something like that that the church is having. You know, like he had to go through a whole laundry list of them with Corinth, but not so much with this one. And this one comes just out of dealing with ordinary life and being able to have joy and have the high life, if you will, in ordinary life. And even how to have joy and victory in those times when you just don't want to, you just don't think it's possible. Maybe some of those experiences like uh, losing your job or, um, Dave, if you were to come home and you, you find out PJ just crashed your van or something like that as he's driving around, uh, some of those kind of days. Deb, I'd say crash the plane, but that would be a whole lot worse and we're not going to go there. Or you've spent four years chained to a Roman guard under house arrest, um, or at least that's what Paul's been dealing with as he writes this. Uh, you got a lot more interesting life than me if that's part of your life experience. It's certainly not one of mine. 
But during those times, we can try to find con- we've got to try and find confidence in something or security in something. Some people, you know, will hold on to their bank accounts and be like, you know what, as long as my 401k is doing okay, or I can ride out some of this bad stuff that's going on, or, um, you know, even though I may have lost my job, I still got my family hanging out with me, and they're not going to leave me, they're not going to run out on me, so as long as I've got my family and friends, everything will be okay, and I'll be secure. Well, as we talked about, uh, what, a week or two ago, certainly all of that can go up and smoke in a heartbeat. Uh, ask Job, ask that rich young fool who uh, you know, would tear down his silos so he could build more, and before he knows it, by the end of the day, everything is gone for him. But for Paul in his before Christ days, uh, his confidence, his security, his uh, legacy was all in, his, in the resume that he had, yeah. which he gives us very clearly in this passage, also in Genesis, uh, not Genesis, Galatians 1, he does the same kind of thing. But he walks through just the various bullet points that he's got on his resume. Where he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Right there in Genesis 17, um, Moses says that throughout your generations, every male among you shall be circumcised when he is eight days old. And Paul's parents would probably be like, male? Yep, check. Eight, eight days old? Yep, check. Bapti- or, I'm sorry, baptized. Circumcised? Yep, check. Done. He's fulfilled the law. He's fulfilled the tradition of his people. He's an Israelite. His other bullet point. Which is to say he wasn't converted into into Judaism. He was born into it. With Hebrew parents, uh, he tells us. And he could follow his family tree, most likely, back to the patriarchs. To Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Coming from the tribe of Benjamin one of the more noble tribes of, uh, of the twelve in Israel. The, the, they were the tribe that gave Israel their first king, Saul. And before Paul became Paul, Paul was Saul. And so he had that extra irony or uh, feather in his cap when it came to his resume, in that he had the same name as Israel's first king. He was the Hebrew of Hebrews, just plain old hardcore about his faith. He was a Pharisee. Not just any regular Jew or Hebrew, but one of the strictest in the Jewish culture, one of the strictest sects in the Jewish culture. And he's got it right there for him. And when he talks about his credentials in Galatians 1, he says, I advanced in Jerusalem beyond many among, beyond many among the people of my same age. For I was more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. So he's not only coming from the best tribe, the best sect, as far as they're concerned, but he's at the top of his class in all of that, too. His resume just keeps getting better and better and better as far as the, the Israelites are concerned. And then he gets to some of the stuff that's uh, maybe not so great. When he says, I was a persecutor of the church. When he basically lived like, Emperor Nero or the Adolf Hitler of the first century. Right up to his conversion in Acts 9, he's off there killing Christians, going to Jerusalem saying, give me the letters, send me out to go round up the Christians, gather them up, bring them to you and kill them. And just two chapters before his conversion in Acts 7, he's got Stephen there down at the bottom of the pit, People all around getting ready to stone me. It's like, got the head, check. Got the chest, check. Got him in the arm, check. I'll sign off on it. Stephen's dead by my hand. I'm proud of it. And that was something Paul would write on his resume and claim as something to hold up, something he could take security in. Concerning the law, blameless. It's amazing when you go back through uh, Deuteronomy or Leviticus and you read some of the laws that Paul would keep and he knew them all and would keep them all. Some of them that one of my uh, Old Testament professors had, had told me that were some of the more obscure that he knew of. One says, You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Out of Exodus 23. It's like, okay. Paul can keep that one. Or Deuteronomy 22. You shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. 
Cloth is one thing. Wool is another thing. Put them together, that's a no-no. Okay. Paul could keep that one. And then, just a little bit earlier, if you come across a bird's nest in any tree or on the ground with young ones or eggs and the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall let the mother go, but the young you may take for yourself, that you may go, it may go well with you, and you may live long. Okay. They're getting more and more obscure. You read in Leviticus, there are rules about uh, if an animal has a cleft foot and chews the cud, you can eat it. But if it has one but not the other, don't eat it. And if it doesn't, just trying to remember them makes my brain hurt. And yet Paul was able to keep them straight and be able to keep them to the point where he would be blameless before the strictest of the church, the Pharisees. If anybody could have confidence in themselves, it was Paul or Saul before, his, before he became a Christian. Paul was living the little man high life in his own way. It's actually the name of the Supertone song that I was kind of reading the lyrics of before. It's called Little Man. But I left off the last line of the verse. And for kind of an important reason, because it really brings Paul's resume crashing down. The song says, I roll with the bigwigs, they think I'm the man. But then I stop and look and think about how big I really am. What's Paul's resume worth to him now that he is after Christ, after Acts 9? Rubbish, trash, garbage, worthless, dung, if you look in the King James Version. Yes, it actually says that. I've looked it up myself. It's all worthless compared to the joy of knowing Christ as his Lord and his Savior. It's kind of like uh, the story of Zacchaeus as Jesus and his disciples are coming into Jericho. And Zacchaeus has heard about this guy, Jesus, but uh, he's kind of a short guy, so as the crowds are gathering, he can't really see him, so he climbs up this sycamore tree. And Jesus, riding in, riding in, calls to Zacchaeus and says, Come down from that tree. I want to have dinner at your house. Zacchaeus probably rushes down that tree just as fast as he went up it. Goes, has dinner with Jesus. And Jesus says, Salvation has come upon this house. And the joy that impacts this tax collector makes him give up quite a bit. I mean, being a tax collector, he's a a rich guy, and he says, half of what I have, I'll give off to the poor. Now, I may not be a rich guy, but if I'm going to give half of what I have to anybody, it better be worth it, at least in my mind. And it is, as Zacchaeus finds out, as he pays back four times what he stole from anybody that he cheated in the past. One writer, one person said, I don't know who it was, uh, but it's a interesting quote. This is one that we ought to put on the bottom of our announcements on the green sheet sometime. It says, "He is not a fool who gives what he cannot ki- who gives what he cannot gain to keep what he cannot lose. He is not a fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose." I have all the tongue twister sayings going on uh, today. It comes down to this. The guy who dies with the most toys doesn't get a bigger mansion in heaven, much as the rich may want to think otherwise. The girl with the strongest, strongest resume doesn't get a, an easy pass through the pearly gates. No matter how much they may think, I've done so much more good than bad. That'll get me in. Here's what it comes down to. At the cross, it's a level playing field. The rich don't have any advantage. The poor don't have any disadvantage. Resumes, good looks, portfolio, black, white, rich, poor, whatever. It doesn't matter. Because our salvation is not based on that resume, our skin color, our looks, our portfolio. But as Paul says, right out of Ephesians 2, from the first verses somebody had me memorize. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one, not even Paul and all his 
Hebrew of Hebrews and tribe of Benjamin and Israel and persecuted the church, not even he could boast of it. So here's where the rub comes. Do we need grace as much as the dropout? Absolutely. Do we need grace and forgiveness as much as the long-haired punk kid who runs through the yard and uh, wears all black and you you think he's got no respect for anything? Yes, we need it just as much as him. But did God send his son to die for the girl who comes up to their parents and says, you know what, I may not have a ring on my finger, but I'm going to have a baby in nine months? Yes, God sent his son for her just as much as for us. God offered that gift on the cross so our sins could be forgiven and our relationship restored by gift. I know you guys may have known this since before I was a kid, but it's a truth that we can take security in. Knowing the bank accounts, family, friends, resume, all that stuff can go away in a heartbeat. That gift lasts forever. That gift can never be taken away. And that is a truth worth holding on to. Please pray with me.